And so I welcome everybody. I see people are joining in. And of course, you can choose if you want to have a camera on or a camera off. I know it's Friday afternoon. I don't know how it is in the West Coast. I'm in Chicago. It's been very cloudy and rainy all day. Is it like that in Michigan, Felix? Uh, it's foggy, actually. Yeah, rainy and foggy, but not too cold. Exactly. I, I keep thinking that if it was colder, it would be all be snow instead of water. Uh, that makes me feel a little better. What is cold to you guys, though? <laughs> I'm in California, so. Uh, well, I'm from Puerto Rico, so anything, I'm very Californian <laughs> in that way. <laughs> but it was like, it, the temperatures felt like negative 25, <laughs> like a week ago. So, you know, 38 feels like spring. It's 38. I hope they pay you guys well enough in that those temperatures. It's interesting how that happens. So, okay. Felix, if you can you just yeah. test that to see if you can have your... You can yeah, share let me screen. try to do my desktop. And if you can give me an audible that you see my slides and not my notes. One second. Share. Okay, one second. And I'm going to... Can you see it? Yes. Slides, but not my notes. Perfect. Not my answering notes. Okay. And so it is a minute to three o'clock. I'm going to give some housekeeping instructions so that Felix can start promptly at 3 p.m. Um, this is the Games and Machines panel. Uh, for some of you, maybe the first panel of the day or the last panel of the day. So I just want to take a moment to thank you and welcome you. Thank you for being here. It's Friday. It's the end of the day. But they saved the most fun panel for last. I'm convinced about this. Um, my name is Natalia Valencia. I teach Spanish at Loyola University Chicago. And I'm here today just to facilitate transitions uh, in between speakers and at the end between everybody who's here and the speakers themselves to just ask questions. So throughout the time that people are speaking, if a question comes to mind and you wanna write it down on the chat, please feel free to do that. Um, you can also write it down for yourself and at the end you can unmute yourself and ask your question directly. I'll give more instructions about that towards uh, the end of the time. So each speaker is gonna have 15 minutes to, to present. Um, and there's some really interesting topics here and I'm really excited to hear what everybody has to say. So we're gonna start with Felix Cronenberg. He teaches at the Michigan State University um, in East Lansing. And the title of Felix's presentation is On Grading and Gamification. And I'm not gonna say anything else because I want to just hear you, Felix. So whenever you're ready. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm very excited to talk today. Um, I, I wear a number of different hats, but I'm actually gonna talk about just my own classes. So I teach in a German program. I don't teach much anymore, only one course a semester, um, but but I will talk about my teaching and not about research and other parts. Um, and I wanted to start with the fact that I am really excited that this conference is happening and that there's so many people there and so many like-minded people. Um, I, I, I hope there's a follow-up anyways. Um, I started with, with some type of ungrading probably 10 years ago, and I'll talk about this. And and I, I see how far we've come. And the pandemic, I think, helped a lot of people try out new things or be more open to things. So I'll talk about one project that I used to do and one that I just did in the past semester. Um, so before I go further, and this term, I heard this quite a bit, was thrown around quite a bit, uh, this term gamif gamification. Um, is misused a lot. People think it's using games or gimmicks, and it can be that. Um, but the way that I understand it is gamification is using gaming features in non-gaming contexts. Um, and um, that can be something, as we've heard, you know, in the keynote, for example, that can be something like um, Duolingo, for example, getting little stars and all of these. Those are certainly gaming features in a non-gaming context, because learning a language is not gaming. It just isn't. It can be part of it. Um, but we can use certain features. Games certainly are um, 
um, really powerful motivators. They can be, not for everyone, but in certain ways. So I wanted to talk about from just from society and from companies that use gamification. I have used this for a lo quite a long time. Anyone who's used fitness trackers, that's gamification. Uh, anyone who signed up for loyalty programs and maybe even chased like silver status or something like that, that's gamification. Um, even our uh, utilities use this um, uh, to compare you to your neighbors. So those are all aspects of using gaming features, whether that's leaderboards or badges or all of these things, but they're fairly superficial in many ways. So I'll talk a little bit more deeply about that. There are some learning management systems that are actually built and technologies that are built on gamification features. So you may have heard about um, class dojo, um, um, class craft, great craft, etc. that use some form of gamification or game-based features in that. Um, okay, I need to see. There we go. So usually when we talk about grading though, um, there it comes. We usually in the US at least we go with a hundred percent, okay? And um, usually we have the worst grade would be a zero and anything in between would be our grade. And the way we usually do most grading is that we take stuff away. So usually when you have a test, let's say, and there are five mistakes, I'm gonna take five points off and then we have a 95, right? So we're starting with a perfect, and it's always a very negative way, okay? Um, so games use a very different kind of way. So games start with zero as a beginner. And we always go up and you have as many tries as you can until you reach 100 points, right? Or uh, 100% or whatever metric we're using here. But psychologically, this is a very different kind of thing. And I've heard in several of the presentations, and I'm really excited about it, different ways of students being able to take um, take uh, assignments again or take tests again or be, you know, um, trying to level up. So that's why games are really addictive. It's one of the addictive ways is it's very positive. It's a, I've heard the term growth mindset quite a bit today. So um, so those are my three. Um, uh, I worked at these three institutions. And for today, I will uh, for the first one, I will uh, talk about Rhodes College in Memphis. About 10 years ago there, we um, started a simulation project um, and the students there created a city called Pfefferhausen. I'm not talking about that much, but it was a really fun project and we built it around several classes and students started having these different missions. And that was all fine and good. But one thing we noticed is, yeah, but not everybody wants to do that. Like 90% of the students wanted that they don't really have a choice. Like we wanted to call it like missions and make it all game-based, but they didn't really have choice. And to me, choice and agency, and I've heard this quite a bit today, is something that um, we usually don't give them. So even if I uh, give my students an assignment and say, you can take it again, it's essentially something that I dictate you have to do this, right? And so um, the idea then was, and this grew out into different classes there in the undergraduate curriculum was, how, what if we just give them lots and lots of these opportunities to choose from and actually see and study and learn from what the students are actually choosing the, if we're giving them the choice. Um, and what we did there was we replaced what was called the culture portfolio, a culture portfolio that really had like do this, do this, do this, do this. Um, and we replaced that with dozens and dozens and dozens of choices and then saw what students did. So um, we use the system that no longer works. Um, it's called 3D Lab. It's actually a gamification system, but we essentially build this around that students could just submit things through the system. The system doesn't matter so much, but it was a very elegant solution and, and it was bad that, sad that it went away. Um, so here are just some, some, some ideas of what you can see that students got alternatives to all of these things that were, they were doing. And we actually used some game design um, advice and we started creating these elaborate tracks of what happens when. So students started something, they could choose to go deeper down a certain route or they could say, yeah, I did this, that was okay, but I wanna do something different. And so some students continued on with the simulation while others started doing different kinds of things. 
And here are just a couple of examples from that. So some students organized board game evenings. Um, some students uh, practiced carols and then had a caroling session in German, of course. Um, some students had a game, um, you know, um, a Jeopardy, Jeopardy night. We had film evenings. So essentially, the students started doing all of these things. And it's too much to tell you about all the different projects that they had. There was actually a design your own quest or a design your own task task where they designed tasks for other students. And they came up with things that as instructors, we couldn't have come up with. So it was really fascinating to see if you give students the actual choice to build this for the other students. The two most popular ones, and I'm no longer at this institution, of course, but 10 years ago, the most popular ones were switch your phone to German. So students did this. And then for the semester, they had their phone in German. And um, the other one was uh, doing, doing certain podcasts and doing the answers um, and the activities that came with the different podcasts. So those were the, the most successful ones. Um, so the students did have a leaderboard and they could see how they were doing, et cetera. I don't think that has a big effect on it. Um, I, we could always see how far students were. Not all of them reached the full potential. So not all of them reached the 100%. And it was mostly um, uh, based on whether they did it or didn't. And I saw several instructors or, or presenters today talk about it. So we could approve it. We could give extra points. We could take points off or we could return it and say, nope, that's not good enough. That doesn't meet our expectations. And I think one of the most valuable pieces was that we were doing this gamification as a team. The whole German program did this together. So we sat down and we came up with a very long Google Doc where we talked about, well, how much is this worth? How much is a podcast with these five activities you know, um, in relation to someone um, organizing a video game evening, for example? And so we talked about these things and said, and so we were incentivizing things. Um, so all small things and big things got a point value. And I think it helped us as a program and was a small program to talk about what is important to us as a program. What do we want to acknowledge as, as good cultural activities and what, uh, what isn't, right? And so um, there was never anything that we then forced them to do. So there was always a choice, right? Gaming systems, of course, can steer you in a certain way. So one thing that we found out over time is that if we have students do stuff earlier, we gave them extra points because students tended to do everything last minute. So using some incentivization. So it was more carrot and less stick, I would say. All right, so fast forward to now. So that was in the past. That was at Rhodes College. And now I'm at Michigan State University. And I want to talk about this past semester. Um, this was... Um, I haven't done this in a few years. And then the pandemic, as for many, triggered uh, certain things. And we also had um, um, violence happening here last February on campus. And to me, it brought back uh, some trauma for students and um, uh, uh, mental health issues for students, anxiety. And we know that students uh, sometimes fear grades and all of these things. So. I thought I would bring this back to my 420 course. So 420 is an advanced German course. I checked in with my colleagues who've taught it previously and they all had different approaches. I had very few students. I had only seven students and they had vastly different linguistic backgrounds. So some of them were quite advanced, had studied abroad for a year. Others weren't quite as far. And there was a big writing component. Um, and with AI coming, this kind of threw a lot of the old concepts um, aboard. And so I started going into a very radical uh, gamification or choice or agency-based approach where the students um, could choose from everything for the whole grade. So the list goes on and on, but they had um, a number of different activities that were very individual. And this was somewhat work intensive for me because each of these were quite different. So the students could actually write an exam or do a vocab quiz if they wanted to, but they could also work on specific grammar topics. They could write long essays or short essays. They could give presentations in class. Um, they could work with chat GPT to correct essays that either that they've done previously or that they did now. They could, um, they could, um, create videos, they could reflect on courses. There was a huge variety 
And what I was able to do, and I acknowledge with a big class and a big teaching load, I would not have been able to do that. Um, I had individual conversations with the students about what they really wanted to do. They were pretty much all, they were all seniors. Um, they were already very experienced. They knew what they wanted. And in, in the feedback that I got was that they really felt heard. They felt that I was talking to them individually about what they wanted and needed. And that was quite different. Some students wanted to practice speaking, others wanted to practice grammar, others writing. Um, and I, I steered it in certain ways in these individual conversations, but this gave us a basis. So everything that we did here uh, was a basis for, um, uh, uh, for, uh, for our conversations, really. And it was probably the best semester I've ever taught. I've taught over 20 years now. This was the most fun I've had, the most I've connected with students, the most I felt re doing relevant things. Uh, they gave me lots of ideas for other tasks that we that we added. And so it was really a, a wonderful experience. And the, the semester unfolded in a way that uh, I couldn't foresee as a young instructor, I would have been scared of that because it means giving up some control and you don't know exactly what's coming, but we were learning together. And I've heard the term coach quite a bit in this conference and in the keynote this morning. And uh, I, I felt I was being a coach. I was not evaluating them per se. All of this was pass fail, by the way. I know a lot of people have used this and I would return stuff to them. If things didn't meet a high mark, I would return it to them. But I would take into account whether they've studied abroad or, you know, if, if they were bilingual or heritage speaker, things like that. I would take that into account. Um, but it worked very well. I was really glad I was able to do it. I wouldn't have been able to do this in other courses where we have more set curricula. Uh, this one was more open. And I think the focus really was to prepare students in their last year to look at advanced aspects of the language and the 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 topic wasn't prescribed, et cetera. There weren't other sections in it. So there were a lot of things going for it. So I'm not able to do this in, in other classes, I think, but this one, it just seemed to, to fit. And I know I'm at exactly at 15 minutes and I just wanted to um, again, reiterate how exciting it is that everyone is um, talking about this today. And I'm I'm excited to connect with all of you and hopefully there are some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. Uh, you do my job so for me. It's so easy. Uh, <laughs> so we're gonna move on, but please like make note of the questions that you have for Felix, so that we can revisit these uh, ideas of fun, balance, agency, and also talk a little bit about how all of this applies when a course may have more than seven students, which is the case for for many many people out there. Thank you, Felix. Uh, we're gonna move on with Bo Liu. Bo Liu teaches at the University of Texas in Austin. And his talk is titled Oscars Night on Grading Language Proficiency with Dynamic Showcase. And if we had tried to time this with the nominations for the Oscar, it might not have aligned so well. So Bo, uh, the mic is yours. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Can anyone see my screen? Okay. So hi, everyone. Um, thank you for coming to this session. My name is Bo Liu. I am Assistant Professor of Instruction at the University of uh, Texas at Austin. Uh, currently, I'm teaching Chinese language and cultures and also uh, doing research on the site uh, in terms of uh, language assessment, learning motivation, and also curriculum design. So today, I'm going to present a, uh, one of the projects in my class I use every semester. It's called, uh, we call it Chinese Oscar Night because I'm teaching Chinese language. So uh, I'm grading language performance with dynamic uh, showcases. So I'm going to talk about this following components uh, in the next 15 minutes. So what is the Oscar night and the rationale and the purpose of uh, doing this? And how do we assess students' language performance and how do we organize the Oscar night? And uh, uh, also I'm gonna showcase uh, one of the students' work. So the Oscar night is an event as a, uh, showcase for students' final projects. Uh, although it's final uh, projects, but it's not graded. It's more like a receiving feedback from the instructor and the students. And the students are required to make a self-directed uh, directed video in the target language. And uh, based on the students and the needs of students, they can work individually or like in the small groups. 
So the rationale of doing this is actually based on the actable proficiency guidelines, three modes of communication, interpersonal, interpretive, and presentational. And actually in one project, this include three modes of communication. So I think that's very comprehensive assessment for my students at the end of the semester. And also it is very creative and interesting uh, based on my uh, the feedback I received from the students. And uh, uh, based on my teaching experience and also uh, my observation, I think students quite enjoy doing this project together. And also they, very, they are very engaging when they do the project. And the purpose of doing this uh, is aimed to evaluate students' language proficiency in terms of the four language skills and also their performance and also showcase their hard work for the whole semester. And we want our students to enjoy the process and also uh, create their own uh, project. So this is the requirement and expectations of the Oscar night. So first of all, I give students uh, choices for like individual work or like uh, uh, small group work. I think it's always good to give you students freedom and options because everyone has different like learning styles and personality. So I think about in the past few years, most of my students still choose to work with the group member because they can get the support and help from their, you know, within the group. So uh, first of all, they need to like uh, form a group and uh, work out their schedule with their classmate. They have plenty of time to meet and finish this project. Usually it's like two weeks and a half. And uh, each group member have, have to have like more or less same level of participation and also language produ uh, production. Um, so it's not allowed to have like one or two person acting or like uh, uh, taking the main role. So everyone's equally important. So first of all, what they can, uh, we, we do in class is we brainstorm a topic within different groups uh, and they can pick whatever topic they're interested in or uh, they can pick something we, we, we went over this semester. And in the class, they brainstorm in each group, I'll just walk around, go to different groups and uh, discuss with them, give some good ideas. And also I'm also, uh, show, I also showed a few examples before we brainstorm. And then they have to work together after class once they have the topic. So they'll work together and writing a uh, skit or like the script about like uh, what story they're going to write, like different roles, different, uh, different performance in the target language before record the video. So uh, they'll work together and uh, in the Google Doc and uh, write the story and different like in you know, dialogue form. Um, uh, and uh, before they turn it to me, they have to, within the group, they have to uh, go over this again, check the linguistic uh, uh, errors, like uh, um, vocab, sentence structure, grammar, and then turn it to me. So whenever I receive the Google Doc from my students, it's, it's quite like a good, so I don't need to put too much comments and suggestions. Uh, sometimes I just like a double check the, the, the linguistic knowledge and uh, give some uh, suggestions on the content. And then I'll return the script to, back to my students. Now they have a week and a half to record the video based on their story. And uh, so this is the three process, the brainstorm in class, writing after class, now provide feedback to them. And then they can record the videos and uh, they have the time to record and edit the videos. So during this uh, editing process, I literally just check, uh, check the, the language, the content, give uh, brief uh, suggestions out of encouragement to my students. And uh, how do we organize this Oscar night? As I uh, mentioned earlier, first of all, we're gonna collect a, a student's script and then I'll provide feedback on their writing. And then they'll have the time to make the video, edit the video, and also, uh, uh, and the last, uh, the final week, uh, the one of the day we'll, we call the watch party. I'll bring some Chinese snacks and also like beverages and share with my students. I will have a watch party to watch the videos they make. So after watch each video and uh, the students give feedback, also ask a question to other group member. And uh, since I'm not part of like uh, giving grading, uh, give grade on this part. So they'll vote for like uh, best, we have two like awards. One's like best language, the other one's uh, best performance. So students gonna vote for, for like the best uh, language and the best performance in our class. And then I'll buy the, trophies to, to my students and whoever won the Ox, uh, Oscar, I'll give them a trophies as an award. So uh, since this is like the assessing their performance instead of like a, and a little bit like proficiency, I just wanna briefly touch down the differences between 
uh, performance assessment and the proficiency assessment. So basically what they were doing, like uh, we, we can, uh, is uh, whenever topic they pick is familiar content and uh, context. Based on what they learned, they practiced. Also before they rec record the video, they rehearsed a little bit. And uh, whereas like for uh, perfo proficiency assessment, it's more like a uh, non-rehearsed tasks, like, like the spontaneous conversation and uh, uh, the content and the context is uh, uh, based on their language proficiency level. Um, so that's the differences uh, for the performance assessment and proficiency ass assessment. Uh, I always like to share this uh, primitive image to my students. It's showing like a different, uh, cog different levels of cognitive thinking in terms of learning language. So uh, I think this assessment or like this project also include different uh, kinds of uh, cognitive thinking. First of all, they need to remember what they've learned, uh, the vocab, also the sentence structure, everything they've learned. And then need, they need to move to another level, understand the, the, length, the, the uh, product as, uh, requirement, expectations, also what uh, I'm looking for. And the, during the writing process, or like uh, recording the uh, video process, they are keep applying the language they learned to this project, either from writing or speaking or listening. And uh, also I require them to uh, go over this by themselves, uh, the writing process uh, piece by themselves before they turn it to me. So they are in this process thing within a group, there's a lot of analyzing, evaluating, self-assessment, self-evaluations uh, going on and before they create the final project. And also in uh, my class, a lot of the students are kind of, uh, Sometimes they complain, like, why are we remembering this? Why, have, why, why are we like have to memorize this? I was like, okay, this is the basic standard. You have to re remember it to understand it. Then you can go to different cognitive thinkings and go higher. And I actually provide a lot of like opportunities and practice uh, for my students to apply the language and the creating the language. Um, uh, so uh, based on my, because uh, I teach heritage and non-heritage language lear uh, learners separately. So uh, based on my observation, a lot of my uh, first year non-heritage language learners, uh, their uh, performance level fall into the novice mid-level after a year of uh, Chinese learning. And a lot of my, uh, most of my uh, heritage language learners, uh, their performance after uh, learning one year of Chinese uh, fall into the intermediate mid or intermediate high. So this is like the report on their uh, presentational communication, also their performance. Uh, report. And uh, during this process, I also allow them to use uh, English because especially, first of all, I think realistically, they're not ready to turn to like full immersion Chinese conversation. Um, so the reason why I'm, uh, I'm supporting them to use English during their discussion or like uh, uh, after class uh, work, I think that supports students to become bi uh, multilingual and also enable students to use their full linguistic knowledge and also empower students to participate. Uh, instead of like they have to stick in, uh, in, in the target language. And the last, I'm just going to show you a short video of my uh, students' work. Okay, one second. Why are you doing this to me? Thank <laughs> Thank you. 
大姐，我推了龙腾子，我们带他去看玉香吧。天哪，我需要医生。咋？没有。他死了。<笑>今天晚上会不会去第二次收入五百？讲话很忙，但是我真的很想去，我想做他的好朋友。你觉得他也会去吗？高文忠，嗯、um,。我不知道，可是我知道你不喜欢他。没事，他是我们的朋友，呃，你的朋友。你为什么不喜欢他？因为他，我现在不能告诉你，再说吧。再见。啊，喂呀，我是老尼了。你是为什么找到我的？我有一个问题，王浩是不是你的王朋友？不是不是，我们就是朋友。啊，王鹏，不但不好看，而且聪明。是吗？我觉得他很友好。我要去图书馆，你也去吗？嗯，我不能去，我得帮女友准备她的生日舞会。Okay, I'll stop here. It's basically a murder story. They have to find who murdered that, uh, that girl. Like actually, the cake was poisonous. So basically, I just think、uh, this is a fun project for the students to work as a final project. And if you have any questions or like.、Uh, Comments. This is my email. I'll stay here, and just in case you have any other questions. So I'm gonna move on to the next person. Thank you, Bo. I love how all these presenters are so time conscious. Um, I I thank you for sharing your students' work. Uh, with us. I agree. Someone in the chat said that this is might actually be like Oscar worthy. Is in fact is what they said. Oscar worthy performance. Um, it allows them also to showcase other skills that they have, and that also feeds into like their confidence. You can see how how nicely it's edited and all the captioning. It's wonderful. So we're going to move on to our third and final presentation of this afternoon, which is called machine translation and ungrading. And so for this, we actually have two presenters, Katevan Kupadatsky, yeah, and、yes. Elena Schoonmaker Gates.、Uh, did I? Yeah, Katevan. I'm always so concerned that I'm going to mispronounce someone's. Yes, that's correct.、Name. Thank you.、Uh, and they're at、uh, North Carolina at Elon University, and I hand off the mic to you. Hey, thank you.、Um, thank you so much.、Um, we will share the screen as well. Just give me one second.、Um, okay, and、uh, okay. Everyone see our screen. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank so you. So I'm going to actually start us off, and then Kitevan is going to、um, sort of present the second half. So thank you all for、um, for staying until the end for our presentation, and it's fun to be part of、um, such a fun panel. I mean, today I, I feel like I, I've been taking notes, and you know, I had a couple questions too. So hopefully, well, we do plan to leave time for questions. We don't have a super long presentation today, and.、Um, But essentially, we are going to be talking about research that we've been doing for the past year and a half、um, on machine translation and pedagogy. And essentially, in, in our、um, we teach Spanish, though we have actually done some research on use、um, in multiple languages. 
um, at our institution. And this is actually research that is partially funded by the Center for the Advancement of Teaching and Learning at Elon. Um, and so we do have, we have received a grant and we're doing it um, in partnership with a couple of students, undergraduate students. And so that's been really fun to partner with them and get their take on some of this as well. But um, essentially, like, why are we talking about machine translation? Actually, it's interesting because I feel like it's the AI and machine translation has come up multiple times. I've heard people mention it, you know, it's it's, it's a it's a hot topic these days, as many of us um, know. And it's not anything really new, except that um, as it's gotten so good, in the, if, if all of you have been teaching language in the last decade, you know that it's gotten better and better and ever since about 2000. 2016. And so uh, now it's really almost perfect, in many cases, undetectable, uh, maybe not always culturally accurate, or, you know, there, there are issues, but, um, but, and so ultimately, as you can see there on the slide, it says, you know, students usage and heavy dependence has been identified as a key pedagogical demand that L2 teachers globally face today. And so I think many of us are feeling but yeah, there's there's more use, there's more dependence. We sure have noticed it in our in our students, their use and sometimes abuse of, of machine translation. And we feel that it does impact many times negatively their learning. And so um, today, of course, we're gonna be tying it to, um, so we're gonna talk about this research project that we've been working on, but highlighting how it is relevant to ungrading and alternative grading um, activity. So. Um, the main goals of this research, just to give you some background before we jump in um, to the methodology and then and what we did. Um, so last year and last year we did phase one, which was to examine students' perceptions and use of machine translation. And this can be Google Translate. It can be, I mean, uh, many of you may know there are just so many, I mean, um, so many out there, right? Um, and not to mention, I mean, now ChatGPT, I know it can also be used in Spanish, so that is a little different. We're talking more about translating work that they've actually written in English as opposed to generating things completely from scratch, right? Um, but phase two, which is what we're starting to work on this year with the with the students, is to explore the extent of grade anxiety and how that plays a role. Um, and of course, with that um, comes, I think, the question of, well, what can we be doing? What innovative grading or ungrading methods can we be using to reduce that grade anxiety um, to reduce, ultimately, we would hope machine translation use or at least abuse of it, right? I mean, I think that in many cases we found just students really see it as a tool, a learning tool, and, and whereas instructors really see it as the opposite. So that's kind of an interesting yeah, duality there, but also then to promote LSU learning. So we're going to talk a little bit, I think, next about the method that we use. So we had um, over 100 students um, in four different languages. I think we did Spanish, French, German, and Chinese. And they took a questionnaire for us that asked them about these basic things. So the frequency of their use of machine translation, the extent of that use. So like, do you use it for maybe only one or two words or using it for whole sentences or even paragraphs? The reasons or motivations for their use. And we're gonna, that's it. That's highlighted there because that's one of the things that um, really starts to get at the ungrading, you know, things that are relevant to ungrading, and then also their perceived effect of it on their learning. So the questions are, well, how much do they rely on it? And then what reasons do they have? And what teaching strategies do students think would help them depend less? So we're going to also talk about that because we did ask them about that. And so, um, so we did find, and this is not surprising, a lot of previous research, research has already shown this, that you know, nearly all of our participants said that they use machine translation at least sometimes for to complete their coursework, to complete classwork. Um, and it didn't, we had one 1,000 level and 3,000 level students because we wanted to see if kind of their different motivations, we have a, a two semester requirement. And so at the 1,000 level, usually they're just there for kind of gen ed, but at the 3000 level, they're usually majors and minors. And we found that the habits actually were very similar across levels, which was surprising. Um, about half of them also reported frequent use um, and uh, regardless of level. And then 42% of the, like, I think there were 114 total, it says right there, um, reported mm -hmm. extensive use. So like, oh, I, I put whole sentences or whole paragraphs in there and then translate those. 
Um, and also we saw an interesting uh, relationship there. So those who said they reported more extensive use, like full sentences, paragraphs, were also more likely to say more frequent use. So they were the more frequent users. And so the next um, question that Kitevan is going to address is, so what are their reasons? Like what reasons did they give for using it? Okay, so um, yeah, so the, uh, the the second part of the research question was what reasons, um, sorry, what reasons do students give for the usage of um, machine translation? And to be uh, transparent here, we gave them all these options that are listed on the screen. Uh, they didn't come with, up with them, although we also gave them an option of just choosing other and explaining what other could be. And also what we did that was that we didn't limit the reason to one. So we gave them an option to choose as many as they wanted. So the numbers reflect that. Um, so mo most, most of them um, reported that they were using machine translation to learn vocabulary and grammar which actually uh, it might not pertain particularly to this presentation was, but was very surprising to us because um, the research has shown that machine translation does not um, teach or and does not improve uh, students' um, proficiency, um, uh, their vocabulary or grammar. But student perception was that they were using it to improve their vocabulary and grammar to save time and um, also to get a better grade, uh, they used it when the assignments were too difficult, which also, in our opinion, connected to their desire to get a better grade, because if the assignment was perceived as difficult, they were um, aware of the fact that their grade might suffer because of that. And then not to feel judged in second language. Um, was also something that students, many students, reported as an issue or, or as a reason for them using uh, machine translation. Um, so, um, so as it says here, just under half, 45 to 48 percent, reported using machine translation to get better grades, to save time, to complete assignments that were too difficult and some of them, 25%, roughly mentioned feeling judged. But our uh, kind of conclusion from all of that was that grades and difficult assignments were especially uh, kind of uh, causing or uh, were cited by students, uh, causing their frequent dependence or high dependence on machine translation. So this um, kind of got us thinking about our pedagogical practices and our expectations um, related to what students can do, how much time they need to do things, and um, you know the ways we uh, evaluate or judge their learning by assigning grades. Um, and then the other question that we also asked it was which teaching strategies will reduce students' dependence on machine translation. And uh, here again, not surprisingly, the answers were less emphasis on grades, not penalizing mistakes, more support for learning, judgment frame, and more time for assignments. And yes, yeah, certain percentage of them, 32% of them said, no matter what, I will still use machine translation. Okay, well, we will leave behind the 32%, but just the fact that all of this seem to be somehow connected to students' um, anxiety, grade anxiety, right? Because not penalizing mistakes means they're, they make mistakes and they're scared of these mistakes because their grades suffer because of that. They don't feel that they have enough support for learning again, feeling that we are judging them instead of supporting them um, in their learning process, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we really, so this was kind of a preliminary questionnaire, which we will be kind of digging deeper into these questions 
um, the sprint as we have like more individual kind of lengthier interviews with students. But they, there, is, there was a clear indication that students' dependence and use or abuse of machine translation was very tightly connected to their feeling that they had to perform better because of the grade that they depended on. So that was, um, yeah. And so they, um, we, we do have a couple of questions for everybody. Uh, I guess we have time for those, but we're also opening it up to um, other questions um, if people have any, but this is the, because this is basically the end of, yeah, our presentation as well.